Welcome to this episode of Now That's Something Good, the podcast where we explore the extraordinary in the everyday ordinary. Now here's your host, Sarah Good. Hey friends, welcome back. We are so glad that you are here with us, tuning in wherever. I gotta tell you, we are loving being back to recording episodes and sharing stories. Something that Will and I talk often about and we've been sharing with every guest that comes on is we don't know who's listening. We have no idea when you might be hearing this. You might be listening on the day it released. You might be releasing the, or listening the next week. You might be listening six months or a year later. And that's really cool to us because we believe so much in the power of story and that no matter where we're at, we can learn something from someone else. When we just take a moment and we pause and we listen and we really hear to understand and listen to, into somebody else's life, there's so much that we can learn. So we are so glad that you are joining in with us. If you're brand new to our podcast, we are so glad that you're here. We care a lot about stories and we care a lot about good things and we care a lot about coffee around here. So you might hear us talk about that every so often, but we are so thankful that you're here with us. If you are brand new, make sure to go check back out our other episodes. We have a whole season's worth of really incredible stories that we would love for you to hear. Today, we're going to talk with my friend, Matt. You'll hear me share on the podcast a little bit of my reasoning for wanting to bring him on, but he is just a hobby enthusiast is what I want to say. He's really, you're going to hear him talk about really big on wanting to have experiences and find joy and enjoyment in his life. And I love that. And I think every single one of us can learn something from Matt's story today. So here's my conversation with my friend, Matt. Hey friends, welcome back to Now That's Something Good. Today in the studio, I have my friend, Matthew. Say hi, Matthew. Hello. Well, Matthew, I just got to start right off. I feel like I'm going to have you introduce yourself, but I get confused because sometimes I call you Matt and sometimes I call you Matthew. Do you have a preference? Matt, Matthew, hey you, hey you. Uh, <laughs> Scroby, Scrobless. Um, You'll answer to any and all those? Some others have other. Okay, perfect. So you might hear me today call him Matt and then sometimes I'll say Matthew because my brain is glitching on which thing. But Matthew... Introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us about who you are, your family, and what your life looks like right now. Uh, <laughs> introdu- introductions. Um, introductions. So I am currently a high school teacher. I uh, teach at the high school level and coach uh, football. I've coached football and track. Before that was a youth pastor from a family perspective. Um, I have a lovely wife. Um, I have two kids, one who my youngest is eight, my oldest is 13. Both of them have contributed to, well, all three of them have contributed to the salt and pepper hair, <laughs> for which may or may not really be genetically um, altered on my head. Um, but uh, that that's the specifics. So high school teacher, uh, at one point I was a youth pastor for 13, 14 or so years okay. um, before going into teaching, and here I am. I love it. Well, thanks for coming to hang out with us today. We're going to kind of jump all over the place, but I need to ask you first, Matthew, about your beverage choices that you have with us today. So I don't know if you listen to our show and if you don't, it's okay. There's no, I'm not going to quiz you on if you've listened to any of our episodes of the show, Matthew, but we are big on like coffee when people come or drinks. And so this kind of seems to be a question. So we're just going to start right off with, could you tell everybody what your, you brought your own beverages. You wouldn't let us give you anything to drink. Uh, you brought your you own. did offer me, you know, <laughs> something to drink. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm so I this. was, uh, let's start at college. Um, I think I was going through a 24 pack of Dr. Thunder. Oh gosh. Uh, every three days, <laughs> um, through college, uh, and that carried over into adult life, which was fine, uh, through my twenties and through my thirties. Late part of the 30s going into the 40s, um, I noticed my metabolism was a little bit different um, (laughs) and started making some changes to get away from soda. So I went to Perrier, which is a carbonated um, mineral water. Yeah. I really don't even know what that means, Um, (laughs) but it wasn't sugar filled and went to a Perrier uh, water and... um, there's a coffee drink here, <laughs> which is a nitro cold brew. I'm a coffee snob because I really don't like coffee, and it really has to taste good and probably um, either has to taste really bad, like straight black coffee and thick, 
or <laughs> it has to be something that ta- I, I really don't know what I am in the coffee realm. Yeah. Um, but that's I'm a coffee right. snob in the event that um, I don't know what I'm drinking, but it better taste good. When it I better drink taste it. good. It looks good. You have a good, like a little nitro cold brew vanilla sweet cream one today. So caffeinated for our conversation. Makes me sound very masculine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, you were leaving that part out on purpose. (laughs) We're off to a great start. (laughs) Well, hey, I want to jump back to a little bit of your story, Matthew. Just whatever you want to share with us. I know you just said, are you in your 40s? This is a horrible question to ask you. I thought we were, okay, well, welcome to your 40s. I'm not quite there, but Will's there and, you know, it's coming on us. It's coming fast. Um, Talk to me just a little bit about how you said you were a youth pastor for a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you have a kind of a different story of how you came to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. Just give us a little bit of the Matthew background story, whatever you want to share. Uh, It's pretty quick. Born and raised for the first, oh, five or six years in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City area. Um, My mom divorced uh, around the time I was four, I think remarried around when I was five. Um, she had met a sailor from the Virginia area uh, <laughs> that was in town opening the USS Oklahoma City submarine. And they carried on a long distance relationship. They got, they got married. We moved from there, from Oklahoma to Virginia. We were in Virginia for maybe a year and a half and then went to Washington State because his Station got moved from the Virginia coast to um, the Puget Sound up by Seattle. Mm. So we moved up there uh, shortly, and then we hopped around from that point on from Vir- Virginia to Washington, from Washington to Illinois, from wow. Illinois to Oklahoma. And I know you can't see me, but I'm squinting to try to remember all these moves <laughs> from, so from Virginia to Washington, Washington to Illinois, Illinois to Oklahoma, Oklahoma, back to Illinois, Illinois to Ohio, Ohio to Texas, Texas, back to Ohio, oh my gosh. Ohio up to another part of Ohio and from <laughs> Columbus to Cleveland, then back to Texas. And then, um, that's kind of where that, that second stint in Texas, I was moving into my uh, senior year of high school, was moving back to a high school that I had previously been at uh, before. However, um, and just let's step back just a couple steps. So during that high school transition, um, there was a time where I was at a high school in Columbus, Ohio, or the Columbus area, and moved to the Fort Dallas, Fort Worth area, then back to Columbus and then back to Fort Worth. Those, those moves, there's another move within there that's in Ohio as well, but there's two high schools that I went to twice. Oh, wow. Um, so I was going back to my senior year when I was told I had to move going into my senior year. I was uh, moving back to a school that I had been to, um, previously. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time, um, I had gone through some medical stuff with a football injury um, that had taken me out of sports. I was kind of in a depressive place, and it was kind of a tough move for me, as it is for most, you know, incoming seniors. When yeah, they're told they had to move. But nonetheless, uh, honestly, my parents bought me a new car. Nice, and it was kind of an incentive, or maybe bribery at the time, um, to, to move. And uh, I moved, struggled, um, and in the midst of that struggle and in a non-Christian home, when I moved back to Texas uh, for that final stint and tried to reconnect with all of the friends I had before, Mm. um, there was one problem. Uh, They had all found their way um, to church and youth group and found their way to the Lord. I had not, so Mm. I was definitely an outsider. Okay, yeah. um, And was pulled in really fast. and long story short, um, after being in Texas for about seven months, seven, eight months, um, I found myself leaving school or not leaving, leaving, not leaving school, but a day before school, um, running out of my house, uh, in the morning, my mom, it was 
way before school was supposed to start. And she says, where are you going? And I said, well, I, I got to go up to church. She said, what do you mean you got to go to church? It's a school day. And I said, well, I, I need to get to Brett's house, which was my youth pastor at the time. Hmm. Uh, it was a parsonage. So his house was connected to the church. And uh, so I got in my car. I drove there. I drove to his house, knocked on his door. Um, his wife answered. He was already over at the church, which again, they shared backyards with the church. Um, she said, he's over at church. I jumped the fence, jumped a second fence, jumped a third <laughs> fence, and I pounded on a basement door. Um, he was sitting there at his desk and looks up and uh, he opens that window to the basement door of the church and <laughs> says, Matthew, what, what are you doing here? Um, and I was like, it's time. Um, hmm. And he says, what do you mean it's time? And I crawled through the window down onto his desk, probably broke his keyboard and his computer on my way through <laughs> and sat down in the chair. And I said, um, I've tried a lot of things um, and I'm kind of at a place where, uh, where my life is. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm giving myself to this. Wow. And I accepted the Lord um, there in his office that morning. I was 18 years old, senior wow. in high school. Uh, from there, it took about uh, six more months. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom started attending church. My stepdad, I remember my stepdad's words at that time were, uh, I see what God's done for you, mm-hmm. and I want that. And next thing wow. I know, they're both singing in the choir. And huh. uh, Life's kind of a journey from there, but that's kind of the story of me coming to Christ. That's crazy, though. I love how all those moves and all those things, right? Like, where I'm sure that were really hard, back and forth, all these new places, and then it was back to this place that God knew, hey, this is, this is going to be the spot and those people. And I'm always interested in people's journeys, how all these little things just add up to certain moments that if that didn't happen, who knows what would have happened. Sure. Crazy. Okay. Well, Matthew, so we know each other because we go to the same church. <laughs> um, and this is part of the story I told him before we started recording. I was like, I'm going to tell you a story that I'm not going to tell you yet. And I don't know if you remember, but um, there's a lot of reasons I wanted to bring Matthew on today to just share with us and talk with us. You are, you're going to hate me for saying this, but you are one of the wisest people I feel like I know. You have a great way of sharing things, explaining things. Um, and I want our friends listening to be able to hear some of that today. But we went to lunch very early on and getting to know you and your family. I remember we're just getting to know each other, having all these conversations. And you look at Will and I and you're like, hey, uh, what kind of hobbies do you guys have? <laughs> and I remember at the time I'm like, hobbies, uh, Matthew, I have four kids and I work for a church. Like, I don't have any time for hobbies. But you at the time, I think we're getting into falconry. Am I saying falconry, it? Yeah, Is the that dream, the right? The, okay. the dream has not died. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to talk about, I'm going to come back, but I was so intrigued um, by hobbies because you have been a person that I've heard you talk about different things and I, I just, I love it. So start with telling me like, what, what is it about hobbies? Have you always like had these kind of side things that you love and do and want to try out or how do you come up with these things? Just tell me a little bit about hobbies. Uh, hobbies. Uh, I don't really think of them as hobbies as yeah. much as experiencing life. Yeah. Love um, it. I'm definitely not the person that latches onto one thing. Yeah. And is like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people that sell themselves out to one thing or the other. I mean, the Olympics yeah. are on right now. And yeah. You're watching athletes that Mm-mm. have given everything they have. Yeah. And their parents and their, you know, their guardians, their grandparents have given everything they have to make them achieve some specific goal or yeah. specific dream. Yeah. Matthew's life does not work that way. <laughs> and I'm a person, I just said Matthew's life. I, I, I tend to talk to myself in the third person and it's really not an <laughs> egotistical thing, but there's a lot of times where I'm looking down on my life thinking, what are you experiencing? Mm-hmm. What is Matthew doing? Yeah. And I want to experience a lot and I get bored very quick. Okay, I have a lot yeah. of um, probably ADHD <clears throat> tendencies. So when it comes to hobbies... Um, I'm not very good at being committed to anything. Okay. Okay. I'm fair very enough. Good at being committed to a lot of things. Okay. Um, so that's the experience. I was not the greatest student in school. Yeah. Growing up, uh, which is funny because I became a teacher. <laughs> and now I look at all of these students that are coming through with mm. youth ministry or as a teacher. And one of my biggest questions for them is what, what do you enjoy doing? Mm. And what do you enjoy experiencing? For me, uh, my hobbies, I love sporting activities. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of, when it comes to sports and hobbies, uh, I once told a friend, Mark, uh, he, 
he showed that he could do so many things musically and knew so much about, like, there's just so many things he could do. And I said, you're just kind of a jack of all trades. And he's like, well, wait a minute. That means master of none. <laughs> and that moment I realized part of my makeup was the reality of, I embraced that idea of being a jack of all trades and a master yeah. of none. Yeah. I don't really have a strong desire to master anything, but mm-hmm. I have a desire to experience a lot of things. So I love that. falconry is <laughs> One that started, oh, I don't know, about three years ago, and all the stuff that goes into capturing a hawk and raising a hawk and hunting a hawk and then releasing it back into the wild. Um, so, yeah, that that's a hobby. Sports is a hobby. Coaching is a hobby. Um, an MR340 race, which is the longest paddle race uh, probably in the world, nonstop paddle race, Yeah, I think is how it's touted from Kansas City to St. Louis area. I just jumped into that adventure. I did not really train like I should have <laughs> for it. But for me, it wasn't about the training because it's jack of all trades, master of none in my life. And it's not about it's compete to win or yeah. compete to do well and have the experience of somebody who competes in it and not just doesn't participate, doesn't just participate. Yeah. Um, and so experience that repercussions from it because I didn't train and I <laughs> guess that's part of the, the reality. So I enjoy tons of hobbies. I like hearing other people's hobbies. Yeah. Uh, it tells you a lot about them. Yeah. And what they enjoy and what they like. And honestly, I like conversation and want to hear about what people like. Yeah. So what did it tell you when I was like, I have no hobbies? <laughs> You're like, this girl needs some help. <laughs> She's got to experience life more. When I hear somebody say they don't have any hobbies, that's probably not a reality. Uh, everybody finds outlets yeah. for yeah. which they spend their free time. Yeah. And for some people, that may even that kids may be a hobby. Yeah. And they invest solely in becoming a coach. Or, or I don't know, maybe even a helicopter parent for their for their kid. Yeah. Um, for better or worse, uh, pe- people engage in what they find the most interests in, what brings them fulfillment. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, I have a hobby now. I started a podcast, so that should count. Like that. This is our. We're in the I, middle of my hobby right now. I know, and this high rise studio is fantastic. <laughs> I you just have, have to have great- a, a few things in place for a hobby. I'm like, we got to yeah. do this, this, and this. Well, I love it. So, Matthew, I was reading a book this summer, and it re-engaged this whole thing about hobbies. And they were talking about this whole. You're talking about jack of all trades, but they were talking about doing something for the. Um, just for the fun of it and being an amateur at it and not going, Hey, I'm going to do this because now I can make money doing it or I can sell it or I can do this, but just doing it for the experiment or the experience and the enjoyment. And that's really stuck with me. And I think a lot of people, um, maybe struggle too with like, what do I find that brings me enjoyment and how do I do that? And we can get stuck in just, well, I'm going to my job and I need to do this. And there's nothing wrong with those things, but life is meant to be experienced. And if we're not careful, we wake up one day and we're like, what have I, what have I been doing? Um, and so I really look up to you that you have all these things and the different things you've done. Cause I'm like, this is, this is fun. I need some more hobbies. Try some things just for the <laughs> heck of trying it. Do you have any other hobbies you've tried? Any, any things uh, that didn't yeah. result super well, or you're like, oh yeah. So growing up in Oklahoma, <clears throat> Uh, my mom, Ginger, she, uh, chased tornadoes. Um, oh, I'm remember, so glad you said this. Okay. <laughs> I remember, well, I don't really don't remember, but I remember the stories of my mom telling me that we, we, we would load up in the old Bronco too. Uh, it was red and I mean, red and gray, red and silver. And we'd load up in that Bronco too <laughs> there in Oklahoma city. And we would drive out to the local airport not the major airport, but like a local small airport outside of Oklahoma city. And we would get wind readings and stuff like that. And she was all into that stuff. And we had our radio like CB. And the coolest thing was her CB. She had the ability to contact uh, Gary England in the newsroom in Oklahoma city and, and, and have conversations about what she was seeing. This was before spotter identification and spotter network was out there and people were really able to use cell phones and call in and tell them what they were seeing and, yeah. and things like that with the weather. 
So I grew up around tornadoes and around severe weather. That passion kind of carried on. My mom kind of lost that desire for a while um, through her second marriage and just life and moving around and us getting out of Tornado Alley. But as she uh, eventually ends up back in um, the Oklahoma area, Oklahoma City area, uh, before she passes, she got back into the meteorology and stuff like that. I carried it into college and beyond. Um, made a little money doing it, not much to speak of because cell phones came out and I couldn't sell footage and things like um, mm. would have been possible, but had intercepted a lot of tornadoes. However, not my wife's idea uh, <laughs> of fun for me or her. And uh, my, I've seen over 100 tornadoes, intercepted over 100 tornadoes um, That's between crazy. Kansas, Oklahoma. I'm going to need you to tell us more about this, Matthew, because like you were legit a storm chaser. Like you hear about these things in TV shows. So like you would go, I need you to tell me what like intercept a tornado really means. Intercept a tornado, what it really means. <laughs> uh, like how close well, are you? With, let's yeah. start with this simple. Um, one, storm chasing is not what people think it is. It is not this um, exciting hobby for 24 seven. Yeah. It yeah. is something where you are spending way too much money in gas, <laughs> especially now. I don't know how people chase storms now with gas at almost $3 a gallon, but people chasing storms, it's long hours in a car. It's sleeping in your car because wow. you spend all the money that you had to go do this chase <laughs> on gas and what fast food or gas station food that you could scrounge up to be able to make it happen while your wife or family's at home saying, um, like, we're not spending extra money on this. <laughs> um, so intercepting a tornado for us generally, uh, before we had an armored car, um, we were within maybe a mile wow. or two okay. of seeing uh, the see, seeing actual tornado structures for the most part. It's a lot of hail damage on your car, mm. uh, things like that still, learning to navigate around them. Once cell networks got up and iPads became accessible and cell phones got a, a lot better, we armored a car. Before I knew it, we were getting within 100 yards wow. of the the cyclonic movement of a tornado and uh, taking pictures and talking to news outlets uh, that all ended for me uh, with the tornado that hit the, in fact, the last tornado that I intentionally chased or sought out was the one that hit the St. Louis um, airport. Oh, wow. Which picked up our car and rotated it uh, almost 360 degrees while uh, you were in it, while we were in it. <laughs> Uh, and it was oh, a storm gosh. that we actually picked up way down in Herman area um, and followed it all the way up. And I, I broke the number one rule for my wife, which was if it's at home, you're home. And it went, the storm went almost over our home. Wow. Uh, before it dropped its second tornado, which is the one that hit the airport and picked up our armored car and moved it around. And uh, that, that was the last storm I chased. And I guess... I mean, that's Jack of fairly... all trades, master of none. It was time to, time to move on. Yeah. But when, what, that was in the last 10 years, yeah. seven mm -hmm. years. I mean, like, when did that happen? That's crazy. Okay. So I didn't realize you were doing it that, that still seems recently to me. That seems like a long time to me. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> 10 years, I'm like, I've, well, I've not known you then, but I've known you sure. in four of the 10 years. You know, that's crazy. Well, and I love because you are great. Whenever there's storms, you will often, you will sometimes text Will and I and just be like, you should be in the basement. And I appreciate that. Like, okay, what should we be doing? Do we go somewhere or yeah. not? So we've had some close calls at home here. Yeah. That's amazing. What a fun, see who, not many people have that story, Matthew. Okay. I want you to tell us more about the. MR340. Say it right. MR340 okay. uh, is the MR stands for Missouri River. Okay. 340 stands for 340 miles. It's the longest nonstop paddle race uh, in the world, I believe. Wow. Um, where does it start? Tell it us all. It starts in Kansas City where the call meets the Caw River meets the Missouri River. Okay. And then runs all the way to St. Charles. I say St. Louis, St. Charles, St. Louis. I think you're probably in almost St. Louis County. There's a large place to be able to pull boats and stuff off there. It's the last major boat ramp you're going to get before you hit the Mississippi. Okay. So you don't get all the way to St. Louis, but it is 340 miles. It's a nonstop paddle race, which means 
It doesn't mean you don't stop. It doesn't mean you don't have the ability to stop. Okay. It means that your time continues. There are no mandatory checkpoints that okay. you have to stop at for a given period of time. So okay. you can continue to race nonstop if you if you choose. Wow. Uh, we set out on a goal. Uh, this was me and um, my racing partner from Salt Lake City, Utah, who was a friend <laughs> from Kansas when we lived in Kansas. That was that were neighbors of ours and also friends from from college, but I called him for I don't know, maybe three or four years. Okay, and said, "Hey, I want you to come do this race with me." Now, there's a reason <laughs> I called him. He's a professional adventure racer. Okay. Oh wow. He was just on Amazon's uh, world's toughest race with Barry Grills. Uh, a few years ago, and they raced through Fiji for days on end. Oh my goodness! Through the mountains, through rapids, hiking, biking—like th- that's what he does. Aside from his masonry and uh, masonry work and his wow. uh, design work, so when I called him, he's turned me down for several years, and finally said, "Hey, I- whatever." Wow! Uh, I think it was his way of shutting me up. <laughs> stop! Stop <laughs> calling me and asking me to do this. I'll come do it with you, and then like leave me alone. <laughs> So he and his family drove up. Uh, They had family in Kansas, so it worked out well for them. They were able to see some family, and we engaged on this race. He was obviously pretty well prepared for this because it's what he does. He's not a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. Like He's mastered several things really well. And adventure racing is one of them. One difference for him was this was doing one skill constantly. So that was the tough part for him. For me, it was all tough um, <laughs> because I did not train. I didn't watch the videos that he sent me. I didn't spend time oh, on the no. river. I was just wanting to go experience this. Okay, uh, so wait. So hold I did on. some minimal training. You literally okay. So you found about the you've known about this race for a little bit. How years? Year okay. Decided you want to do it. He says yes, and then you literally like. You did no training? Like, you just showed up? I didn't. He was my ringer. That's what I, I called him. He's my ringer. I love this. And when people are like, you're going to do what? And I was like, don't worry, I got a ringer. <laughs> and they're like, oh, so you're just like going to do this? For-? Like, no, we're going to win. Now, yeah. were we going to win? No. But in my head, I had to think, we're going to do this to win because yeah. I wanted to experience the idea of racing, not just doing this leisurely. Yeah. I love it. So okay. on the MR340, you set out from Kansas City. You're going to... St. Charles, 340 miles. There is a boat behind you. Okay. And there are checkpoints in front of you. And that boat called the Reaper. The hits, Reaper? It's called the Reaper. Oh, and it's God. got these eyes. I, I, I didn't see it at night, but they, I think they glow in the dark. Oh, goodness. It's like a boat, and the windows have been replaced with these big, giant, glow-in-the-dark eyes. I, that um, sounds terrifying. 500 and something boats set out on this. They're broken into multiple divisions. Okay. You have singles division for males. You have single division for females in kayaks or canoes or whatever it may be. There's okay. aluminum. There's paddle. There's foot paddle. There's doubles, tandem. So there's a ton of different entries that you could be in. But there's well over 500 boats in the race. Wow. And you race against two things. One, you race against your division. And then you race against everybody in the field. Okay. Okay. The Reaper follows behind you. And if you don't get to a checkpoint by a specific time, then you are eliminated from the race okay. and are no longer able to continue. Okay. Um, okay. For instance, the starting at Caw Point in uh, Kansas City, the Reaper hits Glasgow and you it closes at like 4 p.m. Wow. So you're leaving out on a Tuesday and you have to make it there by Wednesday by 4 p.m. or, um, or no, sorry, by Waverly. Waverly by um, 8 p.m. And if if you're if you, if you don't meet these checkpoints, yeah. If if the if the reaper passes you on the way, yeah. And it's in front of you, you're not out of the race. Okay. But if it gets to the checkpoint before you do, then you're, you're out. out. Wow. Um, over a hundred boats were reaped in Gosh. the first day. So how many checkpoints were there like that that you had to hit along the way? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so. Okay. And over how many days, like how many miles can you go in a kayak realistically? And like, can I mean, you sure, go? Well, I mean, I'm sure uh, like what's feasible physically, mentally, like all the, cause you're like literally in this two person kayak I, just yes. from, okay. I'm having to wrap my it's, head around this. This is probably one of the greatest experiences of my life. It's so amazing. Uh, in fact, the entire time 
I, I kept thinking, about, so this is a dream. And at the same time, going, why in the world did you do this? <laughs> so leaving Call Point, our first day, we realized in order for us to be ahead of the Reaper, uh-huh. we needed to paddle through the night. Okay. And make it to the second checkpoint, which is Glasgow, Glasgow. It depends on where you are from Missouri or what state you're from on how you how you pronounce it, but it's G-L-A-S-G-O-W. Okay. Okay. And at that point, you're about 141 or so miles into the race. Wow. Okay. So day one, we set out. I'm going to be honest. This is probably the first time I've been honest with my racing partner if he hears this podcast. <laughs> um, I've never paddled a kayak in my life. This is great. Um, Matthew, I, I love this. So You've never paddled a kayak. No. And you go in this race no. and you didn't do any training. I, no, I've done some float trips. Well, I did some strength training. You know, I'm a coach. I, this like, is I amazing. figured it would be okay. <laughs> I figured uh, it would be. So we're, I don't know, 20 minutes into the race and I'm realizing this was a bad idea. Oh, gosh. So I automatically resort to comedy and I start cracking jokes to any boat that could hear me or <laughs> my partner behind me that I could try to calm him down for his reality of understanding that I hadn't really trained for this like I told him I would. Oh, no. Oh, no. So... We make it to Waverly. My whole plan the whole time was I just, we're just going to wave at Waverly uh, because we knew we had to make it past there. Um, that cutoff at that point was 8 p.m. So the race starts at 8 a.m. We needed to make it to Waverly by 8 p.m. Okay. And then we wow. needed to, to carry on to Glasgow, Glasgow, uh, which is, again, further on. So our first time I, we really got out of the kayak, um, which is sitting in a pretty tight space, was 141 Ooh. miles. And we left at 8 a.m. on a Tuesday, and we pulled in through the fog, which slowed us down by about an hour. Uh, we pulled in there about 6 a.m. in the morning. Wow. You were in that kayak that long. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Uh, got out one time just to turn our night lights on, uh, which you required red and green lights on the front of your boat and, and a white light on the back. Uh, I, I got out on some rocks on the side of the bank. Uh, to, to turn our lights on. And I could, I could barely stand. Uh, wow. Got back in the boat and we continued on that evening. The fog set um, and we made it in there. We slept, we hit the ground, I think, and slept on the ground for two hours. Wow. Uh, that evening. And then we're back on the water oh by six to seven, seven to eight, by about 8 30. Okay. Okay. So from there, uh, we had a checkpoint that we were set on. We didn't realize how we had advanced in the standings. Okay. And we were actually in like the top 12% wow. of the race at that yeah. point. Uh, not quite sure how we got there other than a lot of people are just smarter and actually took time to sleep yeah. and, and rest and, and pace themselves. So we thought, Hey, we're doing really good. We'll continue on. Let's push this on. So we set our goal beyond Jeff city. So the next goal from okay. Glasgow would have been Jeff city. Uh, and we decided to set a goal of Portland, which was another probably three hours, three, three, three and a half hours past Jeff city. Okay. Um, night two was the worst experience of my life. Oh it's gosh. Something I never want to experience again. Okay. Night two, one of the things you experience on the water when you're paddling long distances and your body's exhausted are, um, hallucinations. Oh gosh. Okay. And, uh, I have seen mermaids jump out of trees and swim through the water. Yeah. Uh, I saw Mario Brothers pounding through the trees. I saw barges that didn't exist. Yeah. I'm worried about buoys. With a lot of the flooding that we've had in the Missouri River, the buoys are on chains that connect to the bottom of the river. These buoys, with the flooding, you have lots of logs and trees and, and debris that hit them, and they pull these buoys down and get caught on that chain, so they go underwater. And as the, as the water flows and, and, and the current and the, and the force, these buoys will be underwater and you, you have no idea they exist. And then an 80, 90, 100 pound buoy will pop up out of the water for a few seconds and then go back down under the water. Wow. These buoys mark the channel, which is where the water moves at its fastest rate and okay. where your barge traffic is trained to move and, and where your boats move. And where as a kayaker or canoeer on this race, you want to be able to stay in that channel where that fast moving water is. So you stay yeah. from sandbars and things like that. So night two. Oh, gosh. We're shooting for a place called Portland. Uh, we realize about 15 minutes past the checkpoint, we probably should have stopped at, which was our original goal, Jeff City. Uh, my right hand began to give out and swell up to where my fingers were touching. Oh, no. And I lost 
almost all movement in my elbow, all the way down my right forearm. Uh, and the hallucinations began to set in yeah. along with the pain. We were seeing things that didn't exist, mostly for me. Fletcher, my racing partner, had experienced this stuff before. Okay. So I was relying on him a little bit to tell me what was real and what wasn't. Yeah, yeah. And being, uh, I'm not, uh, I've never done a drug, uh, uh, an illegal drug in my life. Yeah. Um, or, or been a drinker and put myself in a place where I wasn't in control of my life. Yeah, or yeah. control of my mind. And for the first time in my life, I had no control. Gosh. Over what I was perceiving of what was real. Yeah. And what was not real. Yeah. And there was no way for me to discern the difference other than my racing partner. Um, and he was having some of those, but at least had experienced them before. Yeah. So what'd uh, you do? How, what'd you guys do? Uh, well, there, so there was two checkpoints between where our checkpoint that we were heading for, which is Portland. There, there's a checkpoint that we were able to hit um, instead so we we found our way to that checkpoint. We had a few close calls between here and there. We had a sandbar, uh, which really is not a dangerous thing to do. I mean, your boat basically runs aground on sand. Okay, you have no idea what's going on, and all of a sudden your boat hits this sandbar and makes an awful sound. Wow. Um, and then you're worried about how you're going to get off that sandbar, and you're weak, and you're tired, <sighs> and you're having a hard time really even understanding what's going on. Yeah. Um, we we were able to to push past that, uh, get off that sandbar. We made it to uh, to uh, to to a checkpoint in Mokane. Okay, which was the checkpoint before Portland. Okay, it's about a forty minute paddle, uh, and then that was our second day. Wow, we got up. Our plan was to sleep for an hour and a half to two hours. And then to continue on to St. Charles, which yeah. was, so day one, 141 miles, day two, a little over a hundred and Gosh. then about a hundred miles, day three. Okay. So, wow. Into St. Charles. And you, own, you, so you did all that on how much sleep over those three? So it's basically three days, three nights, two nights, three, three days. Nights. Okay. Um, so we started at 8 a.m. on a Tuesday. We made it to our first stop on Wednesday at 6 a.m. Got up about. 8, 8.15, and we're on the river until about 3 a.m. Okay. So that would have been what day? Monday to, or sorry, Tuesday to Wednesday. Okay. Wednesday to Thursday. And then landing in um, St. Charles at uh, like 11.58 or something. Wow. Um, in the evening? In the evening. Uh, yeah. That's crazy. Okay. So what time did you, I mean, you, you finished, which is huge. Did finish. I mean, that's a big thing. We'll come back to that in a second. But you made the Reaper never went past. Like, so you guys finished, didn't get. If out, you make, like, if you make it to Glasgow, you're so far ahead of the Reaper at that point. It's not something you have to worry about. Okay. Again, okay. it wiped out over a hundred boats day one. That's crazy. But so, how many boats ended up finishing? Uh, well, know? I would ex- expect some, I mean, there were 500 and something boats over a hundred got wiped out. You had some that just drop out along the way. Yeah. Um, so I, you, you, in that mix of the 520 or 530, whatever boats there are, you probably lost about 150. Okay. I'm just, again, I'm just spitballing. Yeah. It. And so just tell me, what do you have with you? Like, do you just have like a backpack on Like, what do you, did you have to pack all your food and snacks at these Checkpoints. Is there anything to grab water or like another rookie move? Um, oh no! <laughs> you're supposed to have a ground crew. Okay. You're required to have a ground crew. COVID hit, and they created a thing called a virtual ground crew. Okay. Last year, when they did the race through COVID. Wow. Uh, they continued that on because we're still in that time of COVID. I talked to my wife, uh, who is not adventuresome. <laughs> She's not a camper. She's she enjoys the outdoors during the day. Yeah, she hates nature. I <laughs> uh, she hates sweat, things like that. Like yeah. this, this is just not her gig. She's yeah. wonderful at what she does, and and is the great com- a great compliment to me. But yeah, yeah. I convinced her and her best friend to be uh, our ground crew. Okay, and the goal was for them to just meet us once. 
Okay. Halfway. So we carried all of our food. One of our downfalls was our boat was extremely heavy, which slowed us down. And because we only had a ground crew, what was going to be halfway through, we carried way more than okay. many of the boats that were stopping every 50, 60, 70 miles. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, were, we weren't stopping until halfway through the race. Yeah. They did end up meeting us at multiple places after our first stop. Okay. Which is so we could start shedding weight and we were so exhausted. Yeah. But in that process, that ground crew meets you, gives you, you know, takes your trash. Okay. Um, one of the big things of the MR340 is Missouri River Conservation, yeah. which is about keeping our rivers and streams. You pay to be in this race and really win no money. Uh, and all the money that you're putting into it goes back into the state and into okay. uh, keeping our waterways clean. Yeah. Which is an exciting thing uh, and something that I enjoy giving to that relief effort. Yeah. But so you're getting rid of trash, taking stuff on. Um, depending on your boat and your way, some people poop and pee in their boats. Yep. 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 Uh, I'm glad you at, brought that up. I didn't at, want to ask, but I was check, like, how at, do you go to the bathroom in these things, Matthew? Week, like, week, you know. there's, there's lots of different ways. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I could tell you where that water ends some, a lot of that ends <laughs> up and you, you probably won't be in the Missouri river anytime soon, but <laughs> This goes back to my why I don't. I only swim in water. I can see the salt water or chlorinated pools. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it. those are much cleaner. Um, <laughs> don't take it away from me, Matthew. Don't take that away. But reality is, they met us several ways. We we could not have done it without my wife and M, who that's Emily, awesome. Who, who who met us and replenished our water. Yeah, uh, we were consuming approximately 200 ish calories per hour. Okay. Yeah. So you think about the food. Partioned out. I yeah. ate a lot of salmon. Yeah. Uh, packaged salmon. Lots of high calorie, high protein. I made a mistake by taking in too much salt. Okay. And not enough water to balance that out, which increased my swelling, which was okay. not a good thing. Again, another rookie move. But wow. Uh, between that and electrolytes, uh, I'm still suffering and have got some nerve damage in my hand that hopefully will oh, be back no. soon. But okay. Okay. So Matthew, like this is quite the experience. Like, what are some of your? Well, let me ask you this: Would you do it again? Um, well, I could read you a, uh, a a text thread from the MR340 from the Facebook uh, with some people that coined us comedy relief. <laughs> and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It may be something that my racing partner had said to them as we were coming by because. Uh, I was all about telling jokes to anybody I could just to get my mind off the fact that I was in pain. Yeah. And my coping mechanism a lot of times is comedy. Yeah. So on the river, I was telling a lot of jokes. There was one group that we continued to catch up with at different times. And they coined us comedy relief. And she wrote uh, a really long post. They were actually doing this for like their 40th birthday. Uh, oh, married wow. Married a couple with kids. And they finished ahead of us. In fact, not only did they finish ahead of us, but I just want to make this known that Susan and Bob, somewhere you're out there in the St. Louis area, <laughs> and not only did you finish ahead of us, um, and you were my age, <laughs> I know you were in a little bit faster canoe, but you stopped and stayed in a hotel <laughs> in Jeff City, and my heart is still <sighs> still hurts from the reality that you were able to do that and That's tells me just funny. how bad I was at this. That's funny. Um, and you finished ahead of me, and you had never really done this before in your life either. So, <laughs> but we were there comedy relief at different times, uh, and I would say one of the greatest things that I have is is um, her story on Facebook mm. and how many times we popped up in that story. Yeah, that we got to play a role in other people's lives. That's on cool. The journey. Yeah. So what would be some other things you say that you took away from that experience or something you learned or learned not to do again? Well, your or... first question was, would I do it again? Yeah. And uh, I used a lot of different language techniques on the river in talking to other boats about my thoughts about what was actually happening to me and the body and the race. Yeah. And one of the common questions is, would you ever do this again? Yeah. Um, and I had a lot of responses to that, all which ended with the reality of no. I will never do this again. I will do, yeah. But, but again, there were a lot of conversations that, that fed into the reality of me saying no at the end. Um, so would I do it again? Yes, I would do it again. Okay. I would do it differently and, and probably be uh, uh, stupid is not the word. Dumb is not the word. Um, there are people that did this on paddleboards. Oh, my goodness. As in like stand-up paddleboards. 
340 miles on a paddleboard? Yeah. Whew. If I do it again, I'm going to do it on a paddleboard. You're going to do it that way. Because <laughs> it just seems cool. Okay. Uh, and Fair enough. jack of all trades, master of none. I, I guess I've done it in a boat. Yeah. I don't really consider a paddleboard a boat. It's like a surfboard with big paddle. Yeah. And they get to sit down and stretch your legs out and stand up, sit down, kneel. Yeah. I don't know how the core workout. I, I'm sure I don't have to train for it. <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> if I do it again, I'll probably do it on a paddleboard. I love this so much. That's great. Well, see, yeah, you just do the same thing, but you change it up. So it makes it, makes it different. And you have all this experience now. I feel like you kind of need to do it again. I, I wouldn't call it experience. You wouldn't call it experience. What did your partner think about? Like, how did he, like, what's his, what's been his takeaway from the, like, was he like, I'll do this again? Or is he, I mean, is he still talking to you after this? Uh, he's, he's glad to be back in Salt Lake City. Okay. <laughs> um, we had a great time. The, we, we have both shared back and forth. There's nobody we would have wanted to do this with yeah, yeah. other than the two of us. We're That's great so friends. Fun. It's one of those things when you have friends that you distance yourself um, by space yeah. and then by time yeah. for long periods of time where you know Salt Lake City, Utah to, to St. Louis is a, is a long way. Yeah. And even though you have cell phones and they make you seem like you have the ability to be close to somebody, you, you kind of lose touch. Yeah, yeah. However, I always need a Fletcher in my life. And there are people that kind of replace people that play special roles to an extent, but there's still those people that never fully replace that person in your life that is like a perfect compliment to you. And as a friend, he's a perfect compliment that lives way too far away. Hmm. And space and time and even a cell phone hinders the reality of us being together. So this was a great opportunity for us. Would he do a race with me again? Yes. He will not do the MR340 again per our la- our most previous conversation. But if I were to jump into another race with him yeah, and be willing to travel maybe his direction or something that involved multiple things like mountain biking, running, yeah. kayaking, things like that are more his, his uh, jam. Yeah. But... Uh, Will we race again? I I don't I don't know if we will together. Yeah, but that, maybe yeah. I will tell you this. Uh, I learned. I'm not sure how I didn't know this, but the Katy Trail runs along the Missouri River for a long time. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, I I, don't, I think I need to buy a bike. And I think there's a race that goes along the Katy Trail. <laughs> uh, I've never trained really on a bike. Um, well, you figure I think it out. I I've talked a few people into jumping into a Katy Trail race. Um, that's funny. That's coming up. I don't know, maybe well, you year. answered my question. I was like, well, what's next? What are you going to tackle? Uh, well, I, I, I think bike I want to do a bike race. That okay. sounds like, I mean, I've gone on the water. Now it's time to. Yeah. I, I love it. Buy a bike that's too expensive. <laughs> and I don't know. Maybe, so, maybe race a bike. Kathy, what advice would you give to somebody listening going, man, I want to like, so part of what I just love is you just, you just try it. Like, you're just like, Hey, what do I got to lose besides maybe some nerve in your hand? Like (laughs) to try something out, what would you tell somebody if they're like, man, I don't, I don't know how to find a hobby or I'm just not sure what to do. Um, encourage somebody that they should just try the thing they've been waiting to try. Talk to that about for a minute. Oh, it's probably a personality trait. Um, I don't know that everybody's wired that way. I think everybody's wired to experience different things. Yeah. Uh, I've got some friends or acquaintances that I saw an acquaintance the other day that was super excited about uh, hand stitching embroidery. Okay. And I'm thinking, like, there's no way in my life I would ever (laughs) do that. But, like, for them, that was an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was, she was worried about it. She was nervous Yeah, and posted the before and the middle and the after. And there was success and something that a journey along the way, this is a person that likes to quilt and yeah. And they're not old. They're young, like my age. Yeah. Uh, so I I can't, I can't speak to that, but when I see something like that, I think, Hey, that's the process. Yeah. Yeah. It's about finding things that you're interested in, interested in, and pushing your yourself um, out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And again, not everybody's wired to get way out of their comfort zone. But if you can just find 
a small avenue yeah. to get out of your comfort zone, the personal growth that I've experienced and the life joys, I mean, God put me on this planet, I think, to enjoy it mm-hmm. and to, to work through it, uh, be challenged by it, and to remind me at times how small I am. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I have times where I can get pretty prideful. Mm. The Missouri River humbled me very quickly. Yeah. And it's, it's those kind of life experiences. I think just they, shape, they help shape our culture uh, and they also help shape our character. Yeah, for sure. That's amazing. So I want to jump and talk a little about, you talked about football. You used to play football. You're now a football coach and a teacher. What got you into all that? Talk just a little bit about, I mean, you. this is part of what I love about your story. You made kind of a middle of the road in one career path chose a different career path. Talk about getting into teaching and what that's meant in that kind of journey and experience. A jack of all trade, master of none. (laughs) So when I accepted Christ at age 18, of course, I went from non-Christian to to becoming a believer. Uh, And the church that I originally got involved in was a Southern Baptist church. Um, Life carries on through there. I I carry on an internship after I uh, move into decide that I want to move into ministry as a career Yeah, where I spend the next 14 full-time years of my life, as well as the first part of my schooling and my bachelor's degree at uh, Southwest Baptist university. So I went from uh, a a Southern Baptist church to uh, being an, uh, an intern in a Southern, another Southern Baptist church here in the area where I met my wife, then taking my first full-time gig in a, uh, Southern Baptist Church, yeah, and then moving to a non-denominational church, and here comes the jack of all trades, master of none. I went from a, a Southern Baptist to non-denominational church, then on to a Methodist church, which is what brought us here to the St. Louis area, yeah, and then from there, uh, there was a lot of question about what I was going to do next. I did not want to be a lead pastor. Uh, and I had this desire to teach in the classroom. Yeah. I wanted to be around students that um, that were in the classroom, and I have a love for science, and um, began to bridge that gap as I kind of made that transition out of ministry, had another church call me, and I just, I jumped back into what was a comfort zone. Yeah. And took a church at a Lutheran, or took a position at a Lutheran church, again, <laughs> jack of all trades, master of none, so let's just, you know, let's just jump into Try another nomination yeah. here. And uh, I did that for a couple of years. Um, I gave them the news a couple of years in that, Hey, I, I, it's time for me to make this other transition. And, yeah. Uh, we made a lot of great strides there, uh, with what they were looking for. And I, I moved into teaching as a career and then took my past experience of being around students and my love for students, um, at the high school level. And, uh, went through a certification process and ended up in teaching high school Mm. uh, in a county rural school about 45 minutes outside of where we live. And also, so teaching high school, coaching middle school football, middle school track, Mm. because it was 45 minutes away, it was hard for me to get into the varsity realm of coaching just because of time and and drive. Yeah. Uh, I was there for um, a full tenure Mm. and I decided it was time to be back closer to home because, you know, we're raising a 13-year-old and eight-year-old and yeah. wanted to be closer to home. So I moved back to a school district where my wife works here in the Winsville area. And um, so now we're back home and I'm only te- currently teaching one, uh, teaching science still at the high school level, but now coaching at the varsity level as an assistant football coach That's awesome. uh, for, for the school. What have you, what's been some of the biggest lessons you've learned while teaching and being in education and just whether that was as a youth pastor, whether that's been as actually a teacher in a classroom, what are some things you've learned from that? Behind every front door, there's a different story Mm. of every home. Behind every kid's eyes, there's a different brain. Mm. Behind every kid's voice or non-voice, there's a story that they want to tell you. Yeah. which has led me to this reality of everybody's different Mm. and it's taught me patience. It's taught me kindness. It's taught me swallowing my pride. It's taught me at times thinking what I thought needed to be done and the realities of finding what they need done Mm -hmm. and how to meet their need. Uh, The public school classroom has pushed me in that direction, has challenged me in that direction. Uh, 
there's not a one size fits one model for for all for all kids. Yeah. And yeah. where I am now and where I've taught in the past has helped train me and I think equip me and burden my heart for the realities of meeting kids' needs, mm-hmm. meeting them where they're at, yeah. helping them take their next step and understanding that their story's different, mm-hmm. their experiences are different. And my job is to love them. Yeah. And care for them and then bring education to them because yeah. that's my job. Yeah. I love it. Um, what do you wish? So we've got a lot of different listeners that listen, all kinds of life placements, all of that. We love um, that. But for parents listening or aunts and uncles or caregivers, what do you as an educator <laughs> wish that parents or care- caregivers knew about teachers? I can't think of a teacher that I've personally worked with that doesn't truly care. Yeah. We all have patience levels. We all have stories at home as well. Uh, we all have good days. We all have bad days. Uh, teachers are humans. Yeah. Yeah. I remember thinking that my grade school teachers specifically, like, I thought they lived at school. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know. Yeah. They, I, in my head as a kid, I didn't realize they went home to families and, yeah. and yeah. that as I've learned, there's stories behind, but behind every front door Mm -hmm. and there's a different mind behind every set of eyes. Um, teachers are no different and parents are no different. Yeah. Benefit of the doubt. It's good. When parents and teachers and students set, stop and intentionally set aside maybe pride or just acknowledge the reality of difference Mm -hmm. and find common ground in we're humans Mm -hmm. and give each other the benefit of the doubt. I think good conversations can take place. Yeah. Um, And and that's not, that's really not just teacher and student and parent. That's, that's probably just life. It is. Teaching has taught me to, to focus on benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. That's good. I think a lot of our conversations and interactions with people um, would be way different if we took a second to just see that lens and give people the benefit of the doubt. It's part of the reason why Will and I want to share stories because your story is different than my story, which is different than somebody else's story, but they all make up who we are and the lens that we see things through and how we see the world. And that all means something. And everybody, if we believe what we believe about the gospel and about creation and the good news is that, man, the image of God is in every single person, no matter what they look like, no matter what they believe, no matter the differences. And that's what we want to share. That's what we want to do and lean into. So i am not got to benefit from being in your classroom, but I've got to benefit from being your friend. And I'm sure you are great at students. And I know there are a lot of parents and a lot of students that are benefiting from being in your classroom where you can just be another person that is speaking life and will give them the benefit of the doubt and see beyond maybe what's really on just the front side, but go deeper with them. So that's incredible. Matthew, we've already, like, we're almost at the end of our conversation time. Is there anything, it goes so fast. Is there anything that you want to talk about that we didn't talk about yet? Or you want to share or anything you want to tell us? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, for the most part, I'm an open book. Like, do you, do you have any more questions or? Oh, gosh. I'll put it back I've on you. I've questions. I, it's... Um, let me look at my little list. Oh, you know what? I do want to, I want to ask you about this. So you are a dad. You're in a house. You're greatly outnumbered in your home. <laughs> You well, know, we just got a boy dog. Okay, so you even the you leveled it just a little bit. Like more. even the pets were all girls. Are you serious? I didn't even think yeah, about that. Yeah, up until your... this point. Okay, yeah, I forgot uh, well, that you just got a new about, dog. I don't know so... about the hamster. I haven't, I haven't I haven't checked that, but How's the new dog situation going? My wife got a new dog. Okay, yeah. I love that dog. Okay. What's the dog's name? Uh Dakota. Dakota. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yep. The Golden girls, Retriever. Yep. Um, male in the house. Well, it's me and me and him, but he likes to keep me up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But you're raising, you're raising two girls. Two girls. You're getting into the teenage year. You are in the teenage years. What are you, what, Just what advice them. would you give some of our friends that are maybe <laughs> in the thick of parenting right now? Jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> uh, advice. 
or encouragement. Uh, encouragement. Um, description of my life raising girls is a lot like golf. <laughs> okay, you're gonna have uh, to explain this. That's the first thing that pops into my head is golf. Yeah. Um, when you go out onto a golf course, you're up against several different things. The first thing you're up against is the course. Mm. And there, uh, every course has a par, which is the, the norm. It's the break-even point where, like, you weren't great, you weren't bad, like, you were par. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are those who fall under par and look <laughs> up to par. There are those who overachieve par and look back at par like it's yeah. know, a piece of cake. Yeah. But a majority of us are under par and struggling to meet par. Mm-hmm. And I think... F- me raising girls, uh, my wife raising, you know, our girls, it's in life. It's, it's just, it's a constant focus on, I think the pressure is to meet par. Yeah. And that's tough because, uh, par changes for every course you go on Mm -hmm. and wherever you are, uh, you meet the second part of golf, which is being judged whether you are or not being judged, but the reality is you are hmm. by those you're playing with. Yeah. Um, so whether it's raising girls or raising boys or just raising kids in general, yeah, your pars changes with the environment and the course that you're on at the time, be it at church or be it at school or be it at the grocery store. Um, and the people that you're playing with are the people around you that are observing your game. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a, that's a tough thing to work through as a parent mm-hmm. at a grocery store. You might, you know, you're, you're, you know, that, that course has got a par and you're trying to be the best parent you can in that store. And it's been a bad day and your kid's going crazy mm-hmm. and, or you're seeing somebody else's kid and they're, you know, they're not doing what you think they should do. And you're judging that parent. And all of a sudden that parent's not meeting par and that parent's worried about everything that's going on and what's, you know, Mm-hmm. Who's, who's on the course with me right now in this yeah. aisle and who's judging me. And that's stressful and that's hard as a parent. We're also in the time of a pandemic yeah. um, or hopefully coming out of it or mm. at least reaching some new norm. So as you go to a course, there's um, the part of the course, there's the people you're playing with and you're playing with different people all the time. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, I think in the game of golf is the personal reflection. I can't think of a a sport that goes to the intensity, at least in my life, uh, rather than the game of golf, where you're also playing against yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think this is the part of golf and parenting that is probably the most beneficial to me. The other things, I don't have control over the par of a course. I don't have control over the people that I'm always playing with or the people that are observing yeah. my game. Yeah. But I have control over me. Yeah. I have control over whether or not I go to the driving range. I have control over um, my attitude on the course and the way, the way I approach the ball, the way I hit the ball. I, I have control over that. Yeah. Yeah. And the reality is I know that that's not going to be perfect. Right. Right. Um, but... I'm challenged as a parent to, to engage in probably one of the hardest sports, which is probably not golf, but raising kids. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to the driving range. It's, it's finding a coach, uh, lessons, people that want to advance in golf, taking time to not just listen to the crowd around, which a lot of people are coached by those they play with. Yeah. Yeah. That's not really coaching. Yeah. Coaching is intentional. It's finding somebody to directly feed into you. Yeah. That's good. At times that may be somebody I seek out that is an external person that I see, right? It may be somebody that doesn't even have kids. Yeah. Uh, it may be somebody that can listen to me and let me vent instead of venting somewhere else Yeah, um, and controlling, controlling my thoughts. Uh, my wife at times is my greatest coach as a parent mm. when we you know, when we struggle through a situation raising our girls and, and at times remember we're, we're playing this game most often together Yeah, uh, yeah. on the same course. We're judging each other. Um, and 
or also each other's greatest coach, which mm-hmm. which is a little bit of a unique, not unique, but you know, to to those that are that are raising kids, uh, that person you're playing with is and can be a very beneficial coach to you. Yeah. So yeah. raising kids, um, the two things that you don't have total control over is the par of course. You don't have control over all the people that you're playing with or mm-hmm. that are observing your game. Yeah. You do have control over the time and effort you put into the game. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you're not going to be perfect at it. And at days, it's going to get you. Yep. But there's something that always brings me back to golfing. And it's that one shot. It's that second shot or third shot that you hit and you're like, I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. And when you hit those shots or make that putt, it's like getting that win with your kid and you realize, I, I can do this. Yeah. And then having that coaching that you intentionally seek out to, to help you along the way. I love it. That's great, Matthew. Now I feel like I got to go on how to play golf. You should go play golf. I should go play. I'm, it's your it's your next hobby. That's right? my. I feel like that. It Will's giving me Jack a thumbs up behind you. I'm going to learn. That's what I'm going to do this next year. Learn how to play golf. Yeah. Well, I'm in it for the wardrobe a little bit. Matthew is why I do, do hobbies. Let's just have a real on. That's football. I'm all in for the football games. Not because I want to wear the football outfit. I want to go with the sweat. Give me the team uniform or sweatshirts, blankets. Because falls in the or footballs in the fall, right? So when the weather gets cooler. So you like the outfits, but you I like. like <laughs> I don't Some, actually want to play the sport of football. I get the opportunity sometimes to to play in the worship band at the church where we both attend and, yeah, and, and yes, you serve, you but you won't let me wear a kilt on I won't. Uh, stage. <laughs> I, like, I have that. I'm not sure that the kilt is the appropriate attire for worship leading in my... That's just my opinion. I don't know what other people think. You have something that's plaid? I No, I think it's the fact of your legs being shown on the stage. I got, I got, I'll, I'll have good socks. <laughs> Good socks. We'll talk about that. We'll have to see. You'll have to show we'll, up. To, we'll work on that. We'll see if the kilt shows up at, at worship. You never know. I mean, if we went to Scotland, maybe you could lead worship over there and have a kilt. Sounds like a trip. Bagpipe. You should learn the bagpipe. If you learn the bagpipes to match with the kilt, I could go for it. What do you mean by learn? Do you already know how to play the bagpipe? You gotta be able to play a song. Jack, semi, no, remember, Jack of all trades, master of none. Jack this of all would, trades, master of none. This would not be the time to show up on the stage with the kill in the bagpipes and be like, I'm not prepared. I don't know anything. That would be a you'd want to learn we gotta learn a little something. Learn a song. How great thou art on bagpipes. I'm in. Okay, let's do it. And then we'll get the kill and we'll take I a picture. I wish you didn't offer that. <laughs> we'll come back and report how this happens. Well, Matthew, is this on the record? It is on the it's record. On the record. So Thank I've you. got one more. I think you. I think that was actually probably the answer to my last question. But I asked you. So the show's called "Now That's Something Good." You shared with us a ton of good things. But what's something else good? Have you read? Like it can be anything. I always tell people like there's no. You asked be, if you, you just asked if I have something I read. I, yeah. I don't like reading. You don't so, like reading? No. Okay, something like a. I don't know anything. What's good? Anything good? Um. What is good? Being here today was good. Mm. Um, my my new job position is good. I'm yeah. excited to be back close to family. It's exciting, yeah. Uh, where I'm not traveling. I loved the school that I was at. Uh, my family is good. I would not be where I am without their love and their support. Mm. Mm-hmm. My church is good. Mm. Uh, I would not be where I am currently without without my church body and and the love of Christ. And I wouldn't be where I am without without Christ. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a daily reflection. My, my life verse has always been uh, Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives mm. in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for mm. me. That's good. Um, I have flesh patterns. I have habits. I have problems. Mm-hmm. I have victories. I have defeats. But at the end of the day, I'm never defined by those. And what's good is that I have a Savior who, who has set my course yeah. for eternity Yeah, and a family that is not only a church family and my immediate family with my wife and kids and extended family and friends, but I get to do this life with mm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's what's good to me. And yeah. if I can experience some adventure along the way, yeah, then those are good experiences. Um, as I, as, as, as I make the journey. I love it. That's lots of definitely something good things, Matthew. Thanks for being here today with us. 
Our friend Matthew had so many incredible things to share with us. This week, one thing that really challenged me to think about is what am I doing that brings me enjoyment and what kind of experiences am I getting to have? So we would love to hear from you. Let us know what maybe you're currently doing. Maybe let us know your hobbies, what you're doing that just are new experiences, things that are just bringing you joy. We would love to hear from you. Or maybe there's something new. Maybe you were encouraged. Maybe you want to go try the MR340 next year. I'm sure we can link that information for you. Or maybe you want to try something new. I know it's got me thinking about a few new activities I should add in my life just to try something new for the fun of it. Because you know what? I think that's definitely something good. Hey, thanks for being here with us today. If you would take a moment to go review the podcast, if you're over on Apple Podcasts, or better yet, take a moment and think who you could send this to. Who needs a little good in their life today that you could share this episode with and maybe it would bring them some enjoyment. Maybe it's a friend and you're like, hey, I want you to listen to this and let's go find a new hobby together. Maybe you're gonna sign up for that race or something fun. Maybe you're gonna pick up golf, water skiing, falconry, I don't know, the sky's the limit, but go find something fun and come tell us about it because we want to hear about it and share in the good things together. Hope you have a great week and go share a little something good with someone today.